Nobody would do those things just, you know, for fits and giggles. Things aren't okay. And if you have missed it this far, maybe you could clue in now. But again, the whole, oh, it's not pretty anymore, Brittany. That's not pretty. That's ugly. That's ugly behavior. And you look ugly. And now I'm embarrassed. You know, I, mm -mm, this ain't how we do. This ain't how we do. And mom was going to need to go get you some wigs. Because my baby's not going to walk around like that. That's hideous. You know, and so it's like, can she get, no can she do nothing? Is nothing going to be loud enough for people to hear her scream of pain? Apparently not. <laughs> Everyone's got cotton in their ears or something because no one can hear her screaming. Hey, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise. Today we are doing part four of the Britney Spears memoir. And you guys, this part was hard to read. This... This part of the book is where things have just gotten so raw for Brittany, and it's all playing out in front of us. And it's just ugly. It's it's ugly, it's sad, it's heartbreaking. Um, it's really interesting to get her side of why all of this stuff was happening. And we're going to go all the way, like right up into the point when the conservatorship begins. So we're not going to get into what that conservatorship felt like for her. Not a lot anyway. Um, that's next. That's part five. Um, we're going to get right up into when her family tricks her into being taken to the hospital and decides to have a conservatorship. And I mean, you know, it's just wild to me how this managed to happen. Um, I don't understand how any judge was willing to give, of all people, her father this kind of authority over his over her life if they had just done even a tiny bit of background on Jamie. They would have found out that he was not a person who should have control over anybody. He couldn't even have control over his own life. The number of times that he had filed for bankruptcy. You know, if he can't manage his own finances, how is he supposed to manage the finances of a multimillionaire? And what's crazy is that Britney had gotten him out of debt when she was younger, when she'd first started making some real money. And yet at the time of her conservatorship, he has filed for bankruptcy yet again. And it's like, how though? Because Britney's been like chucking money your way this whole time. How are you bankrupt? And how is it that, I mean, you know, the bankruptcy, even aside, just his moral character, anybody who knew him knew he was a hard man, an alcoholic, crazy. And yet suddenly they decide to give him all this authority. So it's so crazy. And uh, Brittany says consistently throughout this section, I know I was partying. I was going out there. I, was, I, I wasn't putting any parameters on my behavior as far as, you know, how silly I was acting. You know, I would just pop off at people. She says, she's like, I got really mean. I wouldn't, I was tired of taking it. And so if, if anybody was to get into my face, I mean, she's like, I would have thrown down. I would have had a physical fight with people. So she's not suggesting that, she was she appeared well during this part of her life and that everybody should have just given her a pass on this. I mean, she admits, she even says, I was acting crazy. I looked crazy. But she's like, if anybody cared to wonder why I was, it was pretty obvious, you know. And we're going to get into what is pretty obvious. Um, and we'll talk about why she says she was acting that way. And I think she does, in a lot of ways, have some very legitimate reasons for going off the rails, especially because she had no structure with which to not go off on the rails. You know, she had nothing to fall back on to give her a support in this kind of environment. So I agree with her. She had a lot of reasons to react poorly to her environment. However, one of the things that I thought of as we were getting along in this situation. I so appreciate her honesty and how often she says, I was bad. I shouldn't have done the things I was doing. I was acting crazy. But she doesn't ever give me any definition of what she thinks acting crazy is. And so it's hard because at the same time, she'll say, a lot of people were criticizing me for what I had done. And I began to internalize what they said. And I believed that what they said was true about me and that I was a really bad person. So then it makes it hard for me to believe when she says she's acting bad, I'm like, well, do you think so? Or is that a reflection and a repetition of what you've heard about yourself? Because she doesn't ever follow it up with anything that would substantiate the claim that she was bad. Now, all of us looking on in the tabloids, it was like, yeah, she's not well. But if the tabloids lie, as she says they so frequently do, then which part that we saw 
was you truly acting crazy in your own estimation. We don't really get any of that. That was a little bit frustrating for me because I just want to know what does she think about her own behavior? What does she qualify as bad behavior? Anyway, suffice it to say, she doesn't think any of it deserved how her parents treated her. And I would agree. I think all she needed was really just, she just needed some people to come in and show her how to deal with grief. And she just didn't have that. But anyway, I just want to get into the material um, and let her speak for herself. Uh, I keep forgetting to ask people, if you would like, comment, subscribe, send to a friend. You know, who doesn't love the story about Britney Spears? Even I, who was not a huge Britney fan, am super into this book. So if you think that a friend of yours would like it, or and even if they're not a Britney fan, the number of times people have told me I didn't think I'd be interested in this book, I can't wait for the next episode to drop. Innumerable times I'm saying this. So... Even if you think your friend might not be like a Britney fan, are they a fan of humanity? Are they a fan of an interesting story? Send send these videos their way. Let them see it. Um, And again, thank you for all the comments. Thank you all for the likes. Um, If you are watching these videos and you keep looking for them, but you aren't subscribed, hey, subscribe. Then you don't have to look for them and hit that bell for notifications. Okay, part four, we're starting in chapter 24. She says that one of the people who really came to her aid during all of this hard time was Paris Hilton. Of all people, you know, everybody was always judging Paris Hilton, but she saw Brittany as a human being and she came to help Brittany during this time. Now, I don't know if I would say help is the right word, but she certainly saw Brittany as a human being when everybody else either saw Brittany as a cash cow or a whore and nobody was willing to just see what she needed. So Brittany says that Paris would show up at her house and be like, let's hang out. And remember, Brittany at this time has two little kids. So that also makes her feel distant from the world because she's got to protect these kids and she's got to make sure that they're okay. And so she's trying to navigate what does motherhood look like and still being a celebrity and still getting to go out there and still getting to live my life as a young 20 something without people judging me. It's not possible. But Paris says that it is. Paris is like, get a babysitter. You can still have fun. You know, you don't need to hole up like this. And you'll remember from our previous chapter that Brittany, right after the breakup of Justin, just kind of went underground. She'd come out to perform, but she wasn't looking to party. She wasn't looking to go out. It just was too much for her. Well, Paris Hilton is helping her to re-identify herself as a party girl. Paris is teaching Brittany that one of the ways that you can cope with sadness is to just go out and just be mindless. Just don't think about it because you're partying so hard. So Brittany says that one of the people who was the kindest to me when I really needed kindness was Paris Hilton. So much of America dismissed her as a party girl, but I found her elegant. The way she posed on the red carpet and always had an arched eyebrow when anyone was mean to her. She saw that I had babies and that I was suffering from the breakup, and I think she felt sorry for me. She came over to my house and she helped me out so much. She was just so sweet to me. Aside from that night in Vegas with Jason Trawick, it felt like no one had been sweet like that to me in ages. Remember, Jason had shown up when Brittany had showed up at Kevin's studio where he was supposedly filming a music video. And instead, he turned it into a nightclub and was smoking a bunch of weed and partying with all these girls and he wouldn't let her into the building. And so she'd gone back to the hotel weeping because she's trying to, you know, pull her marriage together and she can't manage to do it. And then Jason shows up waiting in the wings, I guess. I have no idea how he heard about this. And he's like, are you okay? And we get no more from that story. But that's what she she says. The only other person who ever cared about her at this time was Paris Hilton and Jason Trawick that one time. And you'll recall too, that when she's talking about the breakup from the last chapter, you'll recall that she's discussing the breakup of her marriage. Kevin um, was had cut her off. He was traveling around. He was worried about his career. That's the only thing he cared about. And every time she tried to make inroads with him and be like, hey, we got two kids. Like, let's start our family life. He would have none of it. Anytime she'd show up, he'd be tell his security to escort her away. I have no idea who this guy thinks he is. But eventually she ends up filing for divorce because it's like, um, okay, well, we're not really married. I mean, you have all but left me. And then he tried to act like a big blow. It was like a big blow. Like he couldn't see this one coming. It's like, Kevin, I know you're not very bright, but really, you didn't see this one coming? You haven't seen your wife in weeks, months, years almost. And you got two kids who I don't even know if you know their names. And yet he's he's blindsided. Who could have seen this coming? <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, so she's reeling from the breakup. She's got two kids that she can't get any help with. And Paris shows up at her door and was like, girl, you don't have to be a slave to this life. You know, you can still have a good time. So she said, we started hanging out and she encouraged me to try to have fun for the first time in a long time. With Paris, I went through my party stage. But let's be clear. It was never as wild as the press made it out to be. There was a time when I never went out at all. Finally, with the kids properly supervised at home with a capable caregiver, I did leave home for a few hours. I stayed out late. I drank like any other 20-something. I heard nothing but that I was the worst mother who'd ever lived and a terrible person too. The tabloids were full of accusations. She's a slut. She's on drugs. She said, I never had a drinking problem. I liked to drink, but it was never out of control. Do you want to know my drug of choice? The only thing I really did except for drinking? Adderall, the amphetamine that's given to kids for ADHD. Adderall made me high, yes, but what I found far more appealing was that it gave me a few hours of feeling less depressed. It was the only thing that worked for me as an antidepressant, and I really felt like I needed one of those. Now, she's on an antidepressant. She's on Prozac, but I guess it wasn't doing the trick. So she got on Adderall. You guys, I don't really know much about Adderall, but I have known a person who was on it when he probably shouldn't have been. And it changed his personality completely. And he was never the same again. And even to this day, we don't know who he is. Um, Like he was a high performing individual. And then he started taking Adderall so he could keep being high performing. And I mean, it drove his brain into the ground. And he was never the same again. So if you want to play around with Adderall, do it at your own risk. She claims that she had no interest in hard drugs. Now, I think what she means when she says that is that she wasn't doing street drugs. Like nobody was shooting heroin or smoking crack here. But I think that she dismisses prescription medication as hard drugs. And in my estimation, I'd say they're almost the same thing. Um, Because... You know, she's on Vicodin for her knee. We know about that. She's on Prozac. She's on Adderall. Like prescription medication, she seems to have no problem with that. And by her own claims, she's not taking it as prescribed. So I know she says her drug of choice was Adderall, but I think there was other prescription meds she was playing around with. In fact, the other day I was watching a video. Um, I was I went to go look up the Kevin and Brittany chaotic thing. And I didn't really go very far down that rabbit hole. But I watched this one clip and she and Kevin are having their butts like filled up with some kind of a shots. And I don't know what shots they were taking. This doctor was giving them shots in the ass for I don't know what. And, you know, Brittany's like, it's going to make you feel really good. You're going to sleep really well and all this. I don't know what it was. Um, So I don't, I'm not sure what cocktails of prescription medication she was on, but she says no hard drugs and she wasn't, you know, she drinking was not a problem for her. She says that the truth is, where I grew up, what we did more than anything was drink beer. So to this day, I don't like to drink expensive wine because it burns my throat. And I've never even liked weed, except for that one time in New York when I broke my heel. If I just get a contact high from being around it, it makes me feel slow and dumb. I hate it. And she says, do you know what Paris and I did that supposedly crazy night everyone made such a big deal about when we were out with Lindsay Lohan? We got drunk. That's it. And to that I say, okay, you know, I'm not over here clutching my pearls or anything. Have a drink if you want it. But if anybody wants to tell you that alcohol is, you know, not a big deal and that, you know, at least they're not doing drugs or whatever, I I would say that alcohol is a bigger deal than a lot of drugs. I mean, a person can kill themselves on alcohol. They're not going to smoke themselves to death on weed. Neither one of those, I think, are positive roads to go down. I think they both dull who you are. But I guess, you know, her minimizing her alcohol use and saying, I got colossally drunk. It's not a big deal. I wasn't on hard drugs. Alcohol is way more dangerous than many drugs. And so, you know, I I also don't buy this thing was like, I didn't have a drinking problem. Well, she grew up with somebody whose drinking problem was so significant that to compare yourself to him, you'll never have a drinking problem. You know, you'll always be pure as the driven snow when it comes to the bottle because she's seen people passed out drunk, can't even get up off the floor like day after day after day after day in her own home, people leaving the family to go on these benders. I mean, she's not doing that. So she thinks she doesn't have a drinking problem. But I mean, if you if, if you've got to have alcohol every time you go out in order to get your mind off life, that's a drinking problem. 
Anyway, she said that one time they were staying at this beach house and her mom was taking care of the kids. So she went out with Paris. She said we were hyped up drinking and being silly. It felt good to be with friends and to cut loose. There wasn't one thing about it that felt wrong. At the end of one night, I walked into the beach house, happy for my adventure and still a little drunk. My mother was waiting up. When I walked in, she screamed at me. We got into a huge fight. She said it was because I was wasted. And she wasn't wrong. I absolutely was. But that wasn't a violation of some cardinal rule in our family. And on that night, I'd had her babysit so I could go out responsibly without the kids seeing their mother under the influence. Okay, I want to just say this real quick thing about Lynn. Lynn shows up at the door and is all like, Brittany, this is shameful. What's the matter with you? Wasted. You look like a mess. You want to believe that Lynn was that upset because of maternal fear over what was going on with Brittany's life. You know, here Brittany is, divorced, young, two kids, and, you know, coming back home quite sloppy and just feeling scared. Like, what's happening to you? And, and you know, I, I would love to give Lynn props for that, but none of her actions, certainly up to this point, and as we'll see continuing, would show that, that kind of actual care and concern for Brittany. I think what she was angry about wasn't that Brittany was wasted, but that this behavior is going to lead to a cutoff from the cash. That Brittany might at some point get so sloppy that she can't continue to make the money she's once made, and that people will no longer want to work with her because she seems like she's out of control, and that then the family's going to be plunged into some kind of financial ruin that they haven't known for quite some time. That's why she was mad at Brittany. It had nothing to do with the fact that Brittany had, was a young mother, had gone out. Because Brittany is right. She'd gotten credible childcare. Why can't she go out? Now, I think for Brittany's own uh, reputation, it would have behooved her to be a bit more careful when she did go out just because she knew everybody was watching. It almost is like it's an F you to everybody who's watching like, oh, you think that I'm a mess? I'll show you what a mess is. She's always angry at people for noticing when she goes out and she's real sloppy, but, you know, then don't go out and be sloppy. I said the same thing about Harry when I was reading Spare. He was always so indignant when the paparazzis would catch him, like, losing his shit on somebody and looking like a mess and stumbling through the streets. But it's like, well, then don't go stumble through the streets. If you don't want people to notice and you know people are watching, don't, don't do the things that you know that they love to see you do. You know, if the paparazzi get paid to take a picture of you being a mess, then don't go be a mess. You don't have the luxury of being a mess. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and if you are so, you know, dead set on being a mess and call your friends and be like, we're partying inside and we can be a mess inside, but I can't go out and be a mess. You, you've just got to adjust your life. Anyway, um, she says that when her mother screamed at her like that, the shame set in. She said, the shame I felt killed my heart. I stood there reeling and thought, okay, I guess it's forbidden for me to party. Yeah, well, you know, but you do have two kids now. You do have to adjust what you do. Because I know you're young, I know you're twenty something, and you feel like you, you know, kind of missed the boat to party when you had the opportunity when you were young without kids. But you do have kids now, so you can sit there and sort of be like pout and stick your lip out and be like, I "Guess it's not for me. I don't get to do it." But yeah, it, you don't, because you know what about little Sean Preston and Jane James over there? You know, and they can't have this in their life. They don't need to grow up with the whole world hating on their mom all the time because they're going to hear about it. And if you can do anything to mitigate that for them, then do it. Because Bernie says later on that when it came to the conservatorship, she was willing to do it because of her boys. She would do anything she needed to do to make sure that they stayed in her life. But, you know, well, why weren't you willing to quit partying because you knew it was you, know, you were getting taking such a negative hit. And the only thing I can think is that she didn't have any other way to cope with what was going on in her own head and heart. So, you know, I'd love to say, hey, Brittany, hey, you're a mom, you know, find something else to do. But she didn't know what else to do. This was the way she was going to cope with the bad feelings. And it isn't as though she could fall into the arms of her mother because Lynn is, <laughs> Lynn is the worst. You know, whatever Brittany did, it wasn't going to be enough. If when Brittany wanted to take a break, I don't think you should, though. Because Brittany, if you're not out there, they're going to forget about you. And then when Brittany, you know, decides to go out and party because there's no one to comfort her. Brittany, this is an embarrassment to the family. What's the matter with you? Why are you going out with Paris and Lindsay? Where are your clothes? I, Brittany, I can see your pain. I can see that bra strap, Brittany. You're going out like that? You know, so it's like, you know, completely over-sexualizing Britney on one point, being completely okay with that, and then on the other hand, being like, 
I'm ashamed of who she has become. It's like, well, how do you think she became that way? Have you bothered to parent her at any point? Okay, we got to speed it up. We're only two pages in here. Okay, so she says that my mom always made me feel like I was bad or guilty or something, even though I'd worked so hard to be good. And that's what my family has always done, treated me like I was bad. The fight marked a turning point in my relationship with my mom. I couldn't go back to the way it was. We tried, but it didn't work. No matter how many fans I had in this world, my parents never seemed to think I was worth much. How could you treat your child like that when she was going through a divorce, when she was lonely and lost? Yeah, how could you? That's the thing that is so crazy about this whole book is how, how could nobody have cared that she was hurting? How, you know what I think it is? I think it's the Southern in them. That in the South, and I say this as a Southerner, sweep it under the carpet, just look pretty. Just look pretty. It doesn't matter that life's going to hell in a handbasket, you know? That goes under the carpet, the world didn't have to know about it. But you got to pull your shit together. And I just feel like, her mom was all, she, she was worried about the image of Britney. She didn't care about Britney's heart. She didn't care about Britney's mind. And I, I think that's, you know, I'm not saying this to paint the South with a broad brush. I'm just saying I've seen this a lot. And especially, especially in, in families that are, have been in the South, long time, like roots in the South, the way you do is you don't show your junk to the world. You be pretty. And then you know, and if that, even in your own family, if you got to lie to grandma, grandpa, who, even though family, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a web of secrecy and lies and just don't let anybody know. And, you know, and it's always, everyone's always whispering with each other about what so-and-so did. And do you hear aunt so-and-so did that? Just, even within their own family, there's not openness. Certainly you aren't going to be open with the world. So for Brittany to be parading through the streets in the raw way that she was, would have made Lynn petrified and angry and upset and wanting to do damage control and rewrite the narrative, which eventually she ends up doing in her own book. And, you know, I think that that is a knee jerk reaction to, oh my gosh, Brittany, you're exposing yourself and everything about this family. Oh my gosh, stop it. You know, but none of it was rooted in why is my baby acting like this? Brittany goes on to say in a passage that is tinged with honesty, but still she's afraid to actually go there against her family. She says, giving a person no grace in a hard time is just not nice, especially when you can't take as good as you give. When I started to speak up and throw it back at them a little, God knows they were far from perfect. They didn't really like it that much, but they still held so, mo but they still held so much emotional power over me. And so it's like, even now, she can't fully be honest about her family. She's like, it's not nice what they did to me. And they didn't really like it that much when I would talk back. It's like, well, Brittany, <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's such weak language for what she was actually experiencing. And I don't know if it's just because she doesn't right now have the ability to express herself in a more emphatic way about what they did. But saying it's just not nice and that they didn't really like it when you talked back is such, I mean, that's a measly way to say what you want to say. I don't know if the ghostwriter left it in there because, you know, that sounds like the way Brittany expresses herself. Um, and so they want her voice to come through, but I wish they would have given her some vocabulary there because it, it's a lot more than just not nice. And I'm sure they just didn't quite, I'm sure it was more than they just didn't really like it that much when she talked back. I'm sure they were vicious and vindictive about the way they responded when she had something to say and would throw all her mistakes back in her face every time she wanted to rise up and be like, I don't like this. Okay, chapter 25. She said, everything everybody says about becoming a parent was true for me. My boys gave my life meaning. I was shocked by how much pure and instant love I felt for those tiny creatures. And yet, becoming a mother while under so much pressure at home and out in the world was also much, much harder than I expected it would be. Cut off from my friends, I started to get weird. I know you're supposed to focus only on being a mother at those times, but it was hard for me to sit down and play with them each day to put being a mother first. I felt so confused. All I had known my whole life was being exposed on every level. I didn't know where to go or what to do. Was I supposed to go home to Louisiana, get a house with a wall around it and hide? What I can say now, but couldn't see then, is that every part of normal life had been stripped from me. Going out in public without becoming a headline, making normal mistakes as a new mother of two babies, feeling like I could trust the people around me. I had no freedom and yet also no security. At the same time, I was also suffering, I know now from severe postpartum depression. I'll admit it. I felt like I couldn't live if things didn't get better. And 
you know, my heart goes out to her because being a new mom is hard. It is the complete reversal of everything you've ever known. The freedom of just being able to go do whatever you wanted, I mean, that changes instantly as soon as that baby comes into your life. Your life revolves around those babies, and she had not one but two in an incredibly short amount of time. So as everything in your own personal life is changing, you've given up your body, you've given up your time, but also you've given up the freedom to not care about anybody but yourself because now your heart is outside of your body. Those little babies, there's an incredible amount of anxiety that comes with love because what if something happens to them? And I think she was really, really struggling with that as well. And so she doesn't even have anybody that she can vocalize this to. It, You know, it's really isolating when you have kids and it, there's nobody in your circle that also has kids. Now, she hasn't said that directly, but she's hanging out with Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan, and those are like her best girlfriends. Those people would not understand where you're coming from in new motherhood. And it doesn't, you know, Lynn would come up and babysit for her a lot, but Lynn also seems like she's just there to sort of judge what Brittany does. So it wouldn't have been a freeing thing to have your mom come and help you figure out what motherhood felt like. Also, Lynn had been the worst mother of all time, so I don't think you're going to get parenting tips there. I, I just, I can't even imagine, I cannot even imagine how hard life was right then. And then already feeling sort of like, I don't know exactly what I'm doing as mother and exactly how to do this well. And then every time you go out, the paparazzi are watching you. And then there's all these headlines about, did you see the way she was holding the baby? Did you see how she did this? You know, why did she look so sloppy? Oh, she's like always such a mess. This is the reality. Brittany did look like a mess then. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I mean, she, God forbid she would a comb through her hair. You know, her clothes were always like, literally look like scraps of clothing that she picked up off the floor, you know, wearing scarves for shirts, you know, cut off shorts with the pockets are hanging out. You know, she wasn't as physically fit either as she had been. And so a lot of the clothes were just very unflattering to her figure. And I don't know. I mean, I think it was truly the expression of depression on her physical being in the way she dressed herself. She didn't, she didn't know how to care enough about it. She was too tired to care about what she looked like. And it's just very evident in all of the pictures from this time, um, how little she saw in her own worth. Um, I mean, she didn't care enough about her presentation because she didn't think she was worth the presentation. Anyway, I, my heart goes out to her in this season. It would must have been so hard feeling like there's nowhere to turn and you've got two little kids looking up to you and you, do, you feel like you're a child yourself and you don't know where to turn. She goes on to say that all these other people were doing their thing, but I was being watched from every corner. Justin and Kevin were able to have all the sex and smoke all the weed in the world and no one said one word to them. I came home from a night at the clubs and my mother tore into me. It made me scared to do anything. My family made me... <clears throat> It made me scared to do anything. My family made me feel paralyzed. I gravitated toward anyone who would step in and act as a buffer between me and them, especially people who would take me out partying and get me temporarily distracted from all the surveillance that I was under. Not all these people were great in the long run, but at the time, I was desperate for anyone who seemed to want to help me in any way and who seemed like they had the ability to keep my parents at bay. You know, a word about how she said everybody watched her, but nobody cared what Justin and Kevin were doing. That is such a double standard. And that would have been absolutely frustrating to deal with that. I would say the reason all eyes were on her, though, is because she had been so much more famous than them, even more famous than Justin. And her star had far farther to fall. So people are mean and hateful, and they like to watch you fail. And so watching her fail colossally was a lot more entertaining than you know, watching Justin, you know, have sex with yet one more girl. I mean, like, that's kind of what he did. Okay. And he wasn't doing it in a way that I guess was scandalous. Um, and Kevin, I mean, after a while, like we all knew what Kevin was when he showed up on the scene. There was no surprises. You know, it was a bit of a surprise to see Brittany having such struggles, but it wasn't really a surprise to see Kevin acting like an idiot. He showed up on the scene as an idiot and left the scene as an idiot. Okay, um, she says, she goes on to talk about the situations with the custody. She said, as part of his bid for full custody, Kevin tried to convince everyone that I was completely out of control. He started to say that I shouldn't have my kids anymore at all, which is just rich coming from this guy who couldn't be bothered when his little kids had first been born, could not even have been bothered. He's so busy pretending he's got a career as a rapper, K-Fed, 
and, you know, wandering around shaving his head for what he thinks is going to be this really hard album cover and just acted like a goon. And then when he realizes that it ain't happening for him in the rapping world, now he wants to be the concerned dad who's, you know, hustling around being like, yeah, I really think Brittany, you know, I think we got to keep our eye on her. She, she's, she's trouble. She's struggling. I got to have the kids and all this. And, you know, Kevin, this is the only way Kevin's going to stay relevant is to get in the news fighting for his kids. So that's how he's going to get his next 15 minutes of fame. She said that when he said she was out of control, she remembers thinking in her head, well, surely this is a joke. I mean, that's just for the tabloids. I'm not out of control. She said, when you read about married celebrities fighting, you never really know what's real. I always assume that a lot of what you hear are being are stories being fed to the papers as part of some ploy to get upper hand in a custody battle. So I kept waiting for him to bring the boys back to me after he took them. He not only wouldn't bring them back to me, but he wouldn't let me see them for weeks on end. What? I mean... What is happening here? How is it that one parent can take the kids away? Can you not call the police? Is that not considered kidnapping? Somebody takes your kids. You can't see them. There's no court documented reason why she can't see them at this point. This is just Kevin, you know, having his minute, trying to act all big. There's absolutely no reason for this. So I, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm, I don't understand how it, it is that she allowed him to take the kids for weeks on end and she couldn't get them. You know, if he doesn't want to see her, fine. Send send your parents over to pick up the babies and bring them back. Whatever. But why are you settling for him telling you you can't have the kids? Like, you know, I would flip a table and burn a house down. I would burn a town down if somebody tried to tell me I couldn't see my kids. If my husband decided to just suddenly rise up and be this colossal asshole and wouldn't let me see my kids, come hell or high water, I'd tear that house down and get my babies. Like, What are you saying to me? I can't see my kids. I'm not going to sit here and wring my hands and be like, oh, no, oh, no, I can't see them. <laughs> uh, says who? But the hardships continue. In 2007, her aunt Sandra, who she was super close to, maybe even closer to Sandra than her own mother, um, she died of ovarian cancer. And Brittany says that at the funeral, she cried harder than she ever had. Working felt unthinkable to me. A popular director called me during that time about a project he was working on. I have a role for you to play, he said. It's really a very dark role. I said no, because I thought it wouldn't be emotionally healthy for me. But I wonder if just knowing about the part subconsciously, I went there in my head and imagined what it would be like to be her. This is very strange. Because even though she didn't take the role, she's later going to go on to use the existence of that role as an excuse for some future behavior. Um, she agreed on the phone with the, that director she wasn't going to take on the role. And then she says here, I wonder if I just got it into my head that I was going to pretend to be that person for a while anyway. And then she does. Um, so to be clear, she never played this role in any movie that you and you just haven't happened to see it. She never saw this played this role, but she went ahead to go play it on in real life. She said, on the inside, I felt like a cloud of darkness for a long time. And on the outside, though, I tried to keep looking the way people wanted me to. Keep acting the way they wanted me to. Sweet and pretty all the time. Well, I don't know about sweet and pretty all the time at this point. I, I could certainly see that when she was younger. Uh, you know, at this point in her career and in her public persona, um, maybe maybe sweet. I, I could say that, you know, she was, she, uh, you rarely see her screaming at the paparazzi. In fact, she, she often is like, please, thank you. And, you know, has some lovely manners, but, I, you know, pretty, you know, I don't think she can claim that she's, you know, just this sweet little Southern thing all done up in a dress anymore. She, she looked as rough as she felt inside. Well, she says that the veneer had been so worn away by this point, there was just nothing left. And I was a raw nerve. She looked like it. She says, in February, after not getting to see the boys for weeks and weeks, completely beside myself with grief, I wanted to plead to see them. Kevin wouldn't let, let me in. I begged him. Jaden James was five months old, and Sean Preston was 17 months old. I imagine they're not knowing where their mother was, wondering why she didn't want to be with them. I wanted to get a battering ram to get to them. I didn't know what to do. Kevin has your kids. Little one of your children is only five months old. That child needs its mother. 17 months old. That child needs its mother. I mean, how are you going to accept K-Fed telling you that you can't have your kids? I mean, that guy has not a leg to stand on. 
How in the world is Britney Spears at the mercy of KFED? Are you kidding me right now? You know, show him a burger, distract him for two seconds, grab your kids. I mean, we can figure out a way around this. The paparazzi watched it all happen. I can't describe the humiliation I felt. I was cornered. I was out being chased like always by these men waiting for me to do something that they could photograph. And so that night, I gave them some material. This is devastating. Okay, so remember, she says that the reason she's going to do the the following things is because she was in such a tizzy over not being able to get to her kids. I get that. I think that as a mother, any mother out there who's listening can understand the psychosis that it would create in you to not be able to get to your kids and to feel that the person that you had trusted and actually had those kids with was being so cruel as to deny you time with them. So, I mean, betrayal from the dad, you know, the loss of the kids, the emotional place you would be in would be out of this world crazy. So... I get what she's saying as far as why she does this next thing. She says, I went into a hair salon and I took the clippers and I shaved off my hair. Everyone thought it was hilarious. Look how crazy she is. And even my parents acted embarrassed by me. But nobody seemed to understand that I was simply out of my mind with grief. My children had been taken away from me. With my head shaved, everyone was scared of me, even my mom. No one would talk to me anymore because I was too ugly. My long hair had been a big part of what people liked. I knew that. I knew a lot of guys thought long hair was hot. Shaving your head was a way of saying to the world, F you. You don't want, you want me to be pretty for you? F you. You want me to be a good girl? F you. You want me to be your dream girl? F you. I'd been the good girl for years. I'd smiled politely while TV hosts leered at my breasts while American parents said I was destroying their children by wearing a crop top, while executives patted my hand condescendingly and second-guessed my career choices, even though I'd sold millions of records, while my family acted like I was evil. And I was tired of it. At the end of the day, I didn't care. All I wanted to do was to see my boys. It made me sick thinking about the hours, the days, the weeks I'd missed with them. My most special moments in life were taking naps with my children. That was the closest I've ever felt to God, taking naps with my precious babies, smelling their hair and holding their tiny hands. She finishes this chapter by saying, I became incredibly angry. I think a lot of other women understand this. A friend of mine once said, if someone took my baby away from me, I would have done a lot more than get a haircut. I would have burned the city to the ground. Yeah, friend who said that, uh, yes, I agree. Um, I have no other commentary here except to say that I'm aghast that her family would look on at such a public meltdown and react with embarrassment rather than compassion. Can you even imagine anybody in your life that you'd care deeply about expo- exposing the pain of their heart in such a raw way and then just being like, oh, oh, you're scary and ugly now. Ew, yuck, no. Go over there. Please get some wigs. I mean, the truth is, Brittany's face when she's doing that is scary. She's got this grin on her face that is almost like she's out of control of what she's doing. Like there's something almost maniacal about it. Like like something has taken over her that's like happy at seeing her suffer. It's like the smile on her face doesn't feel like it belongs to her own face. It feels like it is a, a, a force within her that is getting her to do something that is hurting her. And it's happy. Very frightening pictures. And if that's what her family was reacting to, this force that seemed like it wasn't her, then I can imagine being scared by that. But come on, swallow your fear and you know, hold your, your daughter. Make sure she's okay. Nobody would do those things just you know for fits and giggles. Things aren't okay. And if you have missed it this far, maybe you could clue in now. But again, the whole, oh, it's not pretty anymore, Brittany. That's not pretty. That's ugly. That's ugly behavior and you look ugly. And now I'm embarrassed. You know, I, mm -mm, this ain't how we do. This ain't how we do. And mom was going to need to go get you some wigs because my baby's not going to walk around like that. That's hideous. You know, and so it's like, can she get, can she do nothing? Is nothing going to be loud enough for people to hear her scream of pain? Apparently not. Everyone's got cotton in their ears or something because no one can hear her screaming. 
Okay, chapter 26. So now this next chapter is, what what are we going to do now? She shaved her head. She, the whole world is either laughing at her or afraid of her. And she's still without her kids. So the whole act was unhelpful to her in every way. She says, flailing those weeks without my children, I lost it over and over again. I didn't even really know how to take care of myself. Because of the divorce, I'd had to move out of the home I loved and was living in a random English-style cottage in Beverly Hills. The paparazzi were circling extra excitedly now, like sharks when there's blood in the water. When I first shaved my head, it felt almost religious. I was living on a level of pure being. For when I wanted to go into the world, though, I bought seven wigs, all short bobs. But if I couldn't see my sons, I didn't want to see anybody. It's a little odd that she needed to buy seven wigs that all look the same. I don't know. Interesting. Um, but again, I mean, I don't think we can look at anything she does right now and be like, let's parse out some sense in that. I don't think there's much sense to be had. A few days after I shaved my head, my cousin Allie drove me back to Kevin's. At least I thought there'd be no paparazzi to see it this time. But apparently someone tipped one of the photographers off and he called his buddy. When we stopped at a gas station, the pair of them came for me. They kept taking flash pictures with a giant camera videotaping me through the window as I sat brokenhearted in the passenger seat waiting for Allie to get back. One of them was asking questions. How you doing? You doing okay? I'm concerned about you. <sighs> okay, if you're concerned about me, back up and drive that way then. We drove on to Kevin's. The two paparazzi kept following us, taking pictures as I was once again denied entry to Kevin's turned away, trying to see my own children. I mean, uh, then camp out, Brittany. Camp out. Don't leave that doorstep until you get what you want. You know, don't turn and go away. No is not, okay. you can't accept no at this point. Mm -mm, no. After we left, Allie pulled over so we could figure out what to do next. The videographer was right there at my window again. What I'm going to do, Brittany, all I'm going to do as I'm going to ask you a few questions, one of them said with this mean look on his face. He wasn't asking if he could. He was telling me what he was going to do. And then I'm going to leave you alone. Oh, huh, is that, are those the conditions of this relationship, you stranger? I mean, again, Brittany, say no. Don't shave your head. Just say no. Like, don't. <sighs> How she was so colossally failed. It's, in an industry that's going to push you and push you and push you and push you, somebody, she, they should have spent some good, hard cash on teaching this girl some coping skills with pushy people. They should have given her all the tools. Like people are going to try to push you. People are going to try to make you do things you don't want to do. Okay, this is how you say no. This is how you negotiate for yourself. Why was that the skipped part of her education? You know, and so now she, ha she has zero skills. Kevin says no. She's like, oh, okay. And she has to just wander away. No, no. You stand up for yourself. He cannot tell you you can't see those kids. What court has said he can have the kids now all the time? No court has said that. You don't have to accept it. And now this photographer coming up, this videographer being like, well, what I'm going to do now is, no, you're not. Get out of here. You know, drive on, Allie. Why are you even talking to this person? Okay, well, then Allie starts begging with these people. No, Allie, okay. <laughs> This isn't the time to start trying to figure out how to negotiate. Gun it. Drive on. Who are these people? Oh, can you guys like not bother us right now? Allie? You don't ask these people politely, can you please not? Do, do you think that they follow the rules of polite society? They're literally harassing you. You know, this isn't, they're not going to suddenly be like, oh, a light bulb moment. Let me treat this person with dignity and respect. Okay, well, Allie's trying to be polite. Those people don't care. Um, then they just wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop bothering her. And now Brittany's screaming. And they like that. She said, when I reacted, they liked that. One guy wouldn't go away until he got what he wanted. He kept smirking, asking me to the same terrible questions over and over, trying to get me to react. There was so much ugliness in his voice, such a lack of humanity. This was one of the worst moments of my whole life, and he kept after me. Couldn't he treat me like a human being? Couldn't he back off? But he wouldn't. He just kept coming. He kept asking me over and over again how I felt not being able to see my kids. And he was smiling. Finally, I snapped. I grabbed the only thing within reach, a green umbrella, and I jumped out of the car. I wasn't going to hit him, because even at my worst, I'm not that kind of a person. I hit the next closest thing, which was his car. 
Pathetic, really. An umbrella. You can't even do any damage with an umbrella. It was a desperate move by a desperate person. It's so sad. It's so sad, but I'm so, at the same time, equally frustrated. Allie, why are you... Okay, you pulled over to figure out what to do next. Okay, well, why don't you just drive home and figure it out there? Do you know what I almost want to say? And um, hmm, this is just uh, supposition. I'm not really saying that this is true, but let's just consider for a moment. Allie says she's going to drive Brittany over to Kevin's house. Brittany thinks no one will know about it. Suddenly, a photographer shows up, not one but two, and they follow her all the way to Kevin's house, where they proceed to take pictures of her at her lowest moment. Again, being denied entry to see her children by security that used to work at her house and by her husband, who she thought was going to love her forever and infinity. Then Allie says, let's get in the car. She drives down the road a bit, and then they decide to pull over on the side of the road where the photographers, you know, get out of their car and begin to harass Brittany in her vehicle. At no point does Allie decide to gun it. And then Allie decides to extend the experience by having a conversation with them. And then when Brittany is continually being bombarded with questions, Allie continues to sit there. And when Brittany grabs an umbrella and proceeds to about, about to jump out of the car, Allie does not step in. Could one surmise that perhaps Allie was in league? With these photographers, was there some sort of kickback that was promised to Allie if she would cooperate and get them a good photo? Because this behavior to me is whack. All right. Who would sit there with a loved one who is just dripping with grief, anxiety, fear, pain and betrayal and set them in a situation like this if there was nothing in it for them? Unless they were just incredibly cruel and unkind and just liked to watch the pain of a loved one. I mean, I don't understand why Allie is, is, is participating in this experience like this. Big question mark there, Allie. But in typical Brittany fashion, she's so overcome by shame at what she did that she actually sends an apology note to the photo agency uh, from whence these maniacs came and she says to them, I'm really sorry that I acted this way. And then she uses that movie role as an excuse for why she did. She says that she mentioned in the note that I'd been in the running for a dark film role, which was true, and that I wasn't quite myself, which was also true. Now, that's, again, the excuse-making machine goes full blast with this one because she had not accepted the role. She cannot use that role as a reason for her behavior. And she should have said in the note why she acted that way had nothing to do with this movie role which make that she didn't actually have, which makes her mental health even more in question. If she told us the truth, the reason she was really outside of her mind with grief was because she was so torn up about not being able to see her kids. That would have humanized the experience. You know, but to say things like, uh, you know, I was in the uh, the running for a movie role that was kind of dark and I kind of like took on that personality, even though I never even came near to getting the script or being part of that production, but I'm in a weird space. Like that doesn't ring as anything that people can relate to. That sounds crazy, quite frankly, but it doesn't sound crazy to say I am tired of being relentlessly harassed and all I want to see is my kids and you people need to leave me alone. Who could not, who would that not resonate with? Anyway, she says later that paparazzo would say in an interview for a documentary about me that that was not a good night for her, but it was a good night for us because we got the money shot. Can you imagine being such a predator that that would be like something you would say and be proud of your behavior? <sighs> Insanity. Brittany oddly ends this chapter now by mentioning her now husband, Hissam, and she says that he thinks that the whole shaving her head thing was awesome because he said beautiful girls can shave their heads it's a vibe he says it's a choice not to play into ideals of conventional beauty and he tried to make her feel better about it uh, because he feels bad about how much pain it still causes her that's really nice Hassan, but also um she didn't do it as a choice to be beautiful she did it out of a sheer desperation and Hassam seems like he just sort of feeds her what she wants to hear but maybe that's what she needs right now um now chapter 27 she says, I felt like I was living on the edge of a cliff. Sometime after I shaved my head, I went to Brian's apartment in Los Angeles. 
he had two girlfriends from his past in Mississippi with him. So <laughs> you can see Brian's doing real well. And also she said her mom was there. It was like my mom wouldn't even look at me because I was ugly now. It just proved that the world only cares about your physical appearance, even if you're suffering and at your lowest point. Well, the world might be like that, but your own mother shouldn't be. She says that winter I'd been told it would help me to get custody if I went to rehab. And so, even though I felt like I had more of a rage and grief problem than a substance abuse problem, I went. And when I arrived, my father was there. Oh, Jamie's come swooping in. Here he comes. You know, the guy can never darken her doorstep. Not for one minute can he ever be like, baby girl, are you okay? Never can he ever. But when crisis arises, here he comes waddling up from the depths of depravity. And I, you know, I just don't understand who, how this guy is still allowed to be around her. Like I would have gotten security specifically for that man. But there he is again at, uh, you know, her lowest moment. The last time we saw him was when he busted up into her New York apartment after she broke up with Justin, interrogated her with three strange men, and then, you know, left the place. And then the very next day, she's got that horrible interview with Diane Sawyer, you know, but we've heard... <laughs> Neither hide nor hair of Jamie since then, but now he wants to have his peace now that she's in rehab. He sat across from me. There were three picnic tables between us, and he said, you are a disgrace. <laughs> Says the king of disgrace himself. Says the man who would be comatose on the living room floor as Lynn stood over him screaming every night of Brittany's life. Oh, but that's not a disgrace because no one knew about that right? But she's a disgrace because people know about it. So same, you know, same behaviors that are not positive. And I would say that Brittany, you know, was never, you know, Brittany was not lying comatose on the living room floor. Well, somebody screamed over her and woke up all the kids in the house. But her behavior, yes, it's not, it, it's not beautiful behavior. It's not conducive to a respectable public image. Sure. But he's got nary a leg to stand on in this situation. And for him to actually sit across from her and be all holier than thou because his indiscretions were private and hers are public is disgusting. She says, I look back now and I think, why didn't I call Big Rob to help me? I was so ashamed and embarrassed already. But here was my dad telling me I was a disgrace. It was the definition of beating a dead horse. He was treating me like a dog, an ugly dog. I had nobody. I was so alone. I guess one positive of rehab was that I started the healing process. I was determined to make the best of a dark situation. When I got out, I was able to get temporary 50-50 custody through a great attorney who helped me. But the battle kept raging with Kevin, and it was eating me alive. You know, she her dad's not telling her anything she doesn't already feel about herself. She already feels like she's a disgrace. She didn't need somebody to come in there and tell her what she's already telling herself. The voices that talk to her are probably more hateful than any voices outside of her. She didn't need that. She didn't need that. What she needed was a hug. If he wanted her to stop being a disgrace, telling her she's a disgrace isn't going to help things. You know, anybody who thinks that shame is the tactic for change in anybody's life is an idiot. Shame will only get people to drive their behaviors into like more secret places, but it's never going to make somebody have any lasting long change. You know, condemnation isn't the way you get change. And you know, and I think Christ himself came and said that I do not come to condemn. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I think that Brittany was not loved by people who understand that condemnation does not bring about change. They went for the crudest tool in, in the toolbox, and that is a hammer. And they just hammered her constantly and thought that that was going to make her whole. How? Okay, well, anyway, um, she says that Blackout, the album that she'd worked on when her little boys were really tiny babies, was the thing that she was most proud of in her whole career. And it came out around Halloween in 2007. I was supposed to perform Give Me More at the VMAs to help promote it. I didn't want to, but my team was pressuring me to get out there and show the world that I was fine. And the only problem was that I was not fine. She said backstage at the VMAs that night, nothing was going right. There was a problem with my costume and my hair extensions. I hadn't slept the night before. I was dizzy. It was less than a year since I'd had my second baby in two years, but everyone was acting like my not having six-pack abs was offensive. I couldn't believe I was going to have to go on stage feeling the way I felt. Okay, can we just pause for a second? Let's look at the costume. Why was that what they put her in? 
I mean, first of all, honestly, she looks fantastic for having just had two kids in two years. I don't wish I looked that good. But that's just not a costume that she had to wear. It, it's not like she had to wear this costume in order to perform this song. She could have worn something that would have had more coverage that she could have felt comfortable in. Who could go out and perform with confidence if you don't feel confident in your body and you're wearing like a couple of little strips of clothes? You know, give her something she can physically feel confident in so she can exude confidence. Don't be like, that was the worst performance ever. Why did, why weren't you prancing and jumping and whatnot when you know that she didn't feel physically good? First of all, she didn't feel physically well because she felt dizzy and hadn't slept well and all that. But like her, her body, her figure, she's used to doing these real robust moves with this, you know, tight little body. But as somebody who has the three kids herself, no one wants to dance and see this jiggle. You know, I don't want to see it. I know you don't want to see it. So she's kind of not moving a lot. But would you want to move when you got no clothes over your midsection? I mean, this is how we'd be dancing on that stage. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so to make matters that much worse, who should she run into backstage? <laughs> Justin Timberlake. And it's been a while since she'd seen him. And she's seeing him at the lowest point of her life. And everything was going great in his world. He was at the top of his game in every way. And he had a lot of swagger and I was having a panic attack. I hadn't rehearsed enough. I hated the way I looked. I knew it was going to be bad. She says that the entire performance was horrific. Um, she said that everywhere she looked, there were these big screens that were mirroring her image back to her. And she said she felt like she was looking at herself in a funhouse mirror. She said, I'm not going to defend that performance or say that it was good, but I will say that as performers, we all have bad nights and they don't usually have consequences so extreme. She said, you don't usually have one of the worst days of your life in the same exact place and time that your ex has one of his best. Justin glided down the runway into his performance. He was flirting with girls in the audience, including one who turned around and arched her back, shaking her breasts as he sang to her. And then he was sharing the stage with Nelly Furtado and Timbaland. So fun, so free, so light. Later that night, the comedian Sarah Silverman came out on stage to roast me. Okay, and please. I mean, Sarah Silverman is a roast of herself every time she starts to talk. It's the reason why people think that female comedians are not funny. Because she's not funny. She's got that horrible baby voice that she just says these horrifically mean and crude things in. And none of it's ever funny. I don't think I have ever laughed at one thing that Sil Sarah Silverman has ever said. She said that at the age of 25, Britney had done everything worthwhile in her life that she'd ever do. And then she goes on to say that Britney's two babies were the most adorable mistakes Britney had ever made. Britney says at the time she didn't hear what Sarah was saying. She heard about it later because at the time she was backstage sobbing hysterically. <laughs> what the hell, Sarah Silverman? You always were the worst. Why would you do that? Why? Why? Because it's like you, Sarah Silverman is a performer in her own right, she has fame of her own, but she also knows that she herself is a human being. And has she ever received any bad press? How would she like it to have all of the worst moments of her life caught on camera, her grief caught on camera, and then to have somebody else in the industry who knows what it's like to be in the public eye when you're not at your best, come out and just slander you, make fun of you, mock you, ma ma mock your kids, the very point of grief that from which all this stems. In the days and weeks that followed, the newspapers made fun of my body and my performance. Dr. Phil called it a train wreck. Oh, well, nobody cares what Dr. Phil says. I mean, Dr. Phil, he is the most manipulative man I've ever seen. If you've seen him talking to people on stage, look, here's the thing. Um, full disclosure, my mom and I used to love to watch Dr. Phil. When Dr. Phil first came out, we could be out in the middle of the city doing something. We'd check our watches and be like, three o'clock, we better, you know, we're missing Dr. Phil. I'm not even gonna lie, we loved it. But as an adult, now that I go back and I watch some of those episodes and stuff, I'm like, whoa, that guy is a manipulative bastard. Like, he just is so conniving. And the whole idea for the show is so whack that you're going to help these people by exposing them and embarrassing them and then, like, not really give them any true advice and then offer them a stint at a rehab facility that they typically don't even finish the duration of. It's such such a messed up show. But anyway, uh, at the time he was in his heyday. So I guess a word from Dr. Phil would have embarrassed you. Now she said she was supposed to do press for this, but she didn't. And the only press she did for Blackout was a live radio interview with Ryan Seacrest, if you want to call it that. You guys, I looked that interview up the other day. Uh -huh. I don't know what was going on. 
He calls her house and she's not awake. She's got two people in the house with her, a guy and a girl who I can't remember who they were. Um, and they're like, uh, okay, just a second. We'll go wake her up. So they wake her up out of a dead stupor. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning. And Ryan Seacrest is clearly like trying to make something of this weird, awkward moment. He's trying to have a conversation with her, but her friends keep talking for her. And Brittany's kind of like real spacey the entire time. At one point, she just like gets up and walks away from the conference call. So then her friends are like answering the questions for Ryan Seacrest. Um, and, you know, he's kind of like, maybe we should call back at a later time when she can talk. And I mean, it's just in the responses, all the questions are super awkward, even when Brittany is on the phone. She doesn't like seem to be able to hear him very well. He keeps asking the same question over and over. At one point, he's like, so have you been eating? You know, what did you have for breakfast today or whatever? And what did you know, your album came out last night? Did you celebrate? Uh, She's like, No, we just got takeout. And he's like, Oh, yeah, takeout. She's like, Yeah. He's like, well, what kind of takeout? I know you've been eating a lot of good food lately. I've been seeing all those pictures of you and all those, you know, drive-in windows. It's like, well, no wonder she got up and walked away from this. You know, it, it just, it's the worst and most embarrassing thing. And if that, it's unfortunate that that was the only press she did for the album because it was colossally cringe, the whole thing. Anyway, um, what she remembers as, uh, being offended about was that he asked, how do you respond to those who criticize you as a mom? Do you feel like you're doing everything you can for your kids? How often will you see them? You know, just we're talking, you're here to talk about the record, not here to talk about my kids. And so she, it was definitely not cool for her in that interview when he asked and her friend keeps trying to like shift the conversation. He's all like, um, yeah, let's talk about something more positive. She says, I felt like the only thing people wanted to talk about was whether or not I was a fit mother. Not about how I'd made such a strong album while holding two babies on my hips and being pursued by dozens of dangerous men all day, every day. Well, she, but this is the problem. Change the narrative, Brittany. Don't be a victim to it. If you don't want people to be saying those things to you, come out strong. Say, I am so proud of this album. I worked so hard. And the thing that is wild about this album is it's so good, even though my personal life was so busy. I just had two babies. In fact, sometimes I'd bring them to the studio with me. And I just knew I had a lot to say. As an artist, I felt like I was at my sharpest at this point. I felt I feel like these songs are super reflective of who I am. And I'm so excited. Let's talk about the songs I'm really excited about on this album. You know, change the conversation. If you don't like the conversation, change it. Now, at this point, her management team had quit. A bodyguard went to court with Gloria Alred by his side as a witness in the custody case, and he said I was doing drugs, and he wasn't even cross-examined. She said a court-appointed parenting coach said that I loved my children and that we were clearly bonded. She also said that there was nothing at all in my home that could be called abuse, but that part didn't make headlines. And it wouldn't because the industry wants her to fail. You know, they've eaten her up. There's there's younger people coming up right behind her. You know, they don't need her anymore. But, you know, she does sell magazines. So she was, she. the only reason that her career was around at that point was because she sold tabloids and the tabloid papers needed her. I know her career, she, she says that her album Blackout inspired many artists and many people have said it was the best one she did. And she personally thinks it's the best she ever did. I don't know. I'm not a connoisseur of her music. So maybe that's true. But I also think that one of the reasons the album did so well at this point was because she was doing so poorly and people were willing to tune in to see like, okay, well, what does this sound like? Does she sound like a train wreck on the album? Anyway, chapter 28. This is the first 72 hour hold that she's going to experience. So we're going from bad to worse. She said, one day in early January, 2008, I had the boys. And at the end of the visit, a security guard who used to work for me and now worked for Kevin came to pick them up. First, he put Preston in the car. When he came to get Jaden, the thought hit me. I may never see my boys again. Given how things had been going with my custody case, I'd become terrified that I wouldn't get the kids back if I gave them back. I ran into the bathroom with Jaden and I locked the door. I just couldn't let him go. I didn't want anyone taking my baby. A friend was there and came to the bathroom door and told me that the security guard would wait. I held Jaden and I cried so hard, but no one was giving me extra time. Before I knew what was happening, a SWAT team in black suits burst through the bathroom door as if I'd hurt someone. The only thing I was guilty of was feeling desperate to keep my own children for a few more hours and to get some assurance that I wasn't going to lose them for good. I looked at my friend and just said, but you said he would wait. Once they'd taken Jaden from me, they tied me onto a gurney and took me to the hospital. 
The hospital let me go before the end of a 72-hour hold, but the damage was already done, and it didn't help that the paparazzi were getting worse in their hounding of me. Okay, brief pause here. Brittany, that's how you get it done. You want your kids back? Get them back, right? How is it that Kevin could come and take her kids with a SWAT team, and yet she was always left out at the doorstep begging to be let in by people she used to employ? How is that even possible? You know, I mean, it's like, okay, I know that at this point now they're actually having a custody battle over who gets to have the kids, right? And I guess her her time was up, and so she had to give them back. But the SWAT team can be employed against you, but you never employed police help in order to get your kids back from Kevin? Explain to me, how, how, how does Kevin have the ability, the knowledge, the foresight, and the will to get this done? And yet nobody was offering you these, these same suggestions. Nobody was like, hey, uh -huh. if you want your kids back from Kevin, there's no court appointed times when he can and cannot have them. You know, before there, there was court appointed times, go get your kids. You know, he can't just take them. You, 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 that isn't a possibility. You can't just take the children. Okay. So regardless, they're back in court again. A new custody hearing was held. And I was told that now, because I I'd been so scared to lose the kids that I'd panicked, I would be allowed to see them even less. I felt like no one had my back. Even my family seemed not to care. Right around the holidays, I found out about my 16-year-old sister's pregnancy from an exclusive in the tabloids. The family had kept this from me. This was around the time that Jamie Lynn almost filed for, for emancipation from our parents. Among the things she had accused them of was taking away her cell phone. She wound up having to talk to the outside world through burner phones that she kept secret. I now see that if someone's not doing well, and I was really not doing well, that's the time you need to come to that person and hold them. Kevin, this would have been the time to ask her into the swimming pool. Kevin took my world away from me. He knocked the breath out of me, and my family did not hold me. I began to suspect that they were secretly celebrating that I was having the worst time in my life. But surely that couldn't be the case, right? Surely I was paranoid, right? Who even knows? I don't know why they would celebrate her demise like this, because she's the cash cow. Wouldn't they want to be able to, you know, keep her working until the end of days? And can you even believe this? Okay, Jamie Lynn, who we all know has had her ways about her this whole time, is on the brink of looking for emancipation from her parents because she says that they are overly controlling, yet not so controlling that they could manage for her not to get pregnant at 16. I don't even know. Okay, it's hard to it's hard to know how bad things were for Jamie Lynn. Obviously, she had the same parents Brittany did. So right there, we're going to go. Probably not a great existence. Jamie Lynn's parents are divorced at this point. Her dad does not live with them. He lives in the original house in Kentwood and... Um, Lynn lives in the big mansion that Brittany had built and Jamie Lynn lives with her. So there's not the dynamics of the bad parents in the same house together with the mom screaming all night at the dad and stuff. Um, but like Brittany has previously stated in this book, Lynn was comatose half the time trying to get over the divorce and self-medicating and she was but a shadow of her former self. And her former self wasn't all that great. So you can imagine what she's bringing to the table now. But Jamie Lynn, to say that she needs to be emancipated um, and her parents are being so mean because they're taking away her cell phone, is it really that bad or is she just throwing a fit? It's hard to know with this one. And we don't get enough information about Jamie, Jamie Lynn. But I can tell you that if she's running around getting pregnant, her parents probably didn't want her to have a cell phone. They probably were trying to control what was going on. And Jamie has been on that Nickelodeon show for a while. I mean, she's pretty emancipated here. She's making her own money. And she's got a an actual, you know, grown-up paycheck. And she's not going to school, you know. So I don't know exactly what it is that she wants to do other than just maybe be dramatic. I don't know. It's hard to know what the kids were, were and were not getting from Mr. and Mrs. Spears. We know what Brittany wasn't getting, but again, the dynamics have changed now that Jamie Lynn's here. So is Jamie Lynn really in trouble or is she just kind of having a fit? Hard to say. All right, chapter 29. She says, Los Angeles is warm and sunny all year round. But in January of 2008, winter actually felt like winter, even in California, because I felt alone and cold and I was hospitalized. She says, I probably shouldn't admit this, but I was hell on wheels. I was taking a lot of Adderall. I was horrible. 
and I will admit to doing wrong. I was so angry about what happened with Kevin. I tried so hard with him. I'd given him everything and he turned on me. Okay, real quick. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, what does she mean by I was hell on wheels? I was horrible. I'll, I will admit to doing wrong. What does that mean? By whose estimation? Explain what you did that was wrong and bad. Not because those words are associated with you by everyone that you have ever known, loved, and cared about. They all label you with those terms. How is that your label? Or is that one that you've learned is your label? Because if I can't get an example of this bad behavior, I don't know how much you actually believe it was bad behavior. I can, like I said at the beginning, from our vantage point, it's not looking great for the decision she's making. From our vantage point, I would say she probably was wilding out pretty extensively. However, I also don't understand if what we were seeing was and over-exaggeration by the media, that yes, crazy behavior, was it legitimately crazy? Well, she says Kevin had just completely turned on her, and she was looking for love in her life. Against all odds, and to sort of perpetuate the idea that she's not doing well mentally, she'd begun to date a photographer, who wasn't just a photographer like, oh, he takes pictures for classy magazines, it's that he was a former paparazzo. But she was completely infatuated by him. And this joker got into her head simply because he acted chivalrous when the chaos was at its peak with all the other photographers, and he would help her out when the others got too aggressive. And for this, she was willing to date the enemy. I mean, she's now turning to her abusers for comfort? This, this is bad. This is really bad. This is the fight, flight, or fawn situation. She's fawning. She's trying to get close enough to the enemy that they can't hit her. And, you know, I, I just feel so badly for her. How bad must it have been that you would turn to the enemy and say, oh, do you see me? You know, you pick up the one guy that's not the worst, and then you try to make something with it. But she's not doing well at all anyway. I mean, that is just yet one more red flag in her existence. She says, back then, I would speak up if I didn't like something. I would certainly let you know. And I wouldn't think twice about it. If I'd been hit in the face in Vegas, as happened to me in July 2023, I'd have hit the person back 100%. I was fearless. She says that she was acting so recklessly at this time that she was playing around with her own life. She said, when it came to being chased by the paparazzi, sometimes they were aggressive and sometimes they were playful. Many of the paps were trying to make me look bad and to get the money shot to show, oh, she's lost. She looks crazy right now. One day, the photographer that I was dating, we were being chased. And this was one of those moments with him that I'll never forget. She says, we were driving fast near the edge of a cliff and I didn't know why, but I decided to pull a 360 right there on the edge. I honestly didn't even know I could do a 360. It was completely beyond me, so I think it was God. But I stuck it. The back wheels of the car stopped on what seemed like the very edge. If those wheels had rotated maybe three more times, we would have just gone over off the cliff. I looked at him, and he looked at me. We could have just died, I said. I felt so alive. So, I think by anybody's estimation, we can go ahead and say she's not okay. That is not normal behavior. But she's also not in normal circumstances. And she's bereft of any kind of scaffolding in order to build a life that's not a mess. So can we fault her for being a puddle on the floor? No. F to be screaming this loud for help and for nobody to, to help you would have only furthered the damage. You know, if anybody at any point, any member of her family had cared to step in, I think, and, and like step in, not like to tell her that she is a shame on the family name, and that she's ugly and hateful and the worst. But if anybody had cared to step in and just put their arms around her and say, how can I help? She would have done anything they told her to do. She was, she's not just being rebellious to be rebellious. She's being rebellious because she's screaming for somebody to help her. And I don't know why it was such a difficult task to step into the picture and be like, Brittany, can I give you a hug? Can we get like, can I, what can I do? How, let's, let's you and me go away together. Let's figure out a plan for how life can, can go like, can, how we can get life back on the rails. Why would that have been so hard? 
Why was everybody just standing around, wringing their hands and jumping forward to criticize her and then, you know, jumping back to wring their hands some more and then jumping forward to criticize her? Like, was it this hard to just figure out like, because it would have just taken a few couple of simple tweaks to just get her marginally better, you know, but enough better that she didn't have to continue to embarrass herself all the time. Continuing, she says, I didn't know then that the photographer was married. I had no clue that I was essentially his mistress. I only found that out after we'd broken up. I just thought he was a lot of fun, and our time together was incredibly hot. He was 10 years older than me. Um, well, you didn't know he was married because you don't ask questions. For her, it would be better to be ignorant than to be informed. And we've seen this play out in many aspects of her life. The I didn't know is kind of her way to get through life. Um, That goes for her career, that goes for her relationships. That's the way she handles any kind of responsibility. I I just didn't know. So I don't know how you didn't know that Kevin didn't have two kids and when you found out you didn't leave him. I don't know how you didn't know this guy was married, Um, but you didn't know because you didn't want to know. I think this stuff comes out pretty easily and pretty quickly if you want to find out. I'm not blaming her for not wanting to find out. If she thought that this guy was the answer to to feeling less unsafe, then I can imagine I probably too would have shut my eyes and plugged my ears and ignored all the signs and all the red flags. She continues by saying everywhere I went, and for a while I went out a lot, the paparazzi were there. And yet, for all the reports about my being out of control, I don't know that I was ever out of control in a way that warranted what came next. The truth is that I was sad, beyond sad. I'm missing my kids when they were with Kevin. The photographer helped me with my depression. I longed for attention, and he gave me the attention that I needed. It was just a lustful relationship. My family didn't like him, but there was a lot about them I didn't like either. The photographer encouraged me to rebel. He let me sow my oats, and he still loved me for it. He loved me unconditionally. It wasn't like my mom screaming at me for partying. He said, girl, go. You got it. Do your thing. He wasn't like my father, who set impossible conditions for his love. I got two things to say. The first one is, she says, I longed for attention and he gave me the attention that I needed. Very few of Brittany's relationships at all, with the exclusion of maybe Justin, has there been any substance to it beyond the fact that they made her feel seen and wanted. But there doesn't seem to be much of a foundation beyond a lustful connection or a... Um, even just an intimacy connection as far as like they want me and I like the feeling of being wanted. And so we'll figure out everything else, you know, can, you know, let's eat some good food and have a few laughs and, you know, call it a day. So I don't think she approaches relationships with the understanding of what could make those lasting relationships. I mean, after a while, you can only eat so much food and have so many laughs and then, you know, and have so much sex and then it's like, okay, now what, you know, um, But the other thing I want to say about this passage is she says that she got in that relationship with him because he wasn't her mother screaming at her and he wasn't her father who put up completely ridiculous conditions in order for her to gain his love. And I think the thing that sort of hit me was imagine what loving people correctly could do for them and imagine what loving people correctly could keep them from. If Brittany's parents had chosen to love her unconditionally and had chosen to help her instead of mock her and shame her and act embarrassed by her, imagine all of the things they could have saved her from simply by being kind, simply by choosing to not be condemning in her behavior. And hear me when I say this, I am not saying we don't hold people to account. That's part of love is to say, hey, we don't want to do that, but let me help you figure out something else to do. Part of loving well comes from allowing people to know that I see those mistakes. I don't love you less because of them. They were unwilling to do those things. But when when people know all that all your dirt, but they still love you anyway, that's when you feel you're most loved. It's not when that person pretends like they don't see it because then you then you always wonder well would they love me if they knew it's when they know what you're up to they love you anyway because of it and then they help you out of it that's what love is and Brittany just desperately 
desperately wanted that. And all the things her parents hated that she was doing, they could have fixed by simply loving her. Okay, to go back to the photographer. He's over there championing anything she wants to do. He's not interested in putting any holds on her behavior. I mean, he's wilding out himself. He's having an affair with her. So like, what's he going to do? Suddenly be the moral arbiter here? So he's 100% okay with every, anything she does. And she says that it felt radical to be that wild. That far from what anybody wanted to, me to be, she was into it. She said, I talked as if I were out of my mind. I was so loud everywhere I went, even at restaurants. People would go out to eat with me and I would straight lay down on the table. It was a way of saying F you to any person who came my way. I mean, I'll say it. I was bad. Or maybe I wasn't bad so much as very, very angry. I wanted to escape. I didn't have my kids and I needed to get away from the media and the paparazzi. I wanted to leave LA so the photographer and I went on a trip to Mexico. And she says that for a short time she felt far away from everything. And it worked. She said she felt better for a little while. And she feels that she should have taken more advantage of that and just gotten away from the frenzy of everything so she could just kind of clear her head. Well, maybe she should have taken advantage of getting her head cleared a little bit more because the end of all that freedom is coming to a quick close. Now, she goes on to say that it seemed like my relationship with the photographer was getting more serious. And as that happened, I sensed that my family was trying to get closer to me in a way that made me uneasy. Well, recall, this is the same kind of behavior that we saw exhibited when she got married in Las Vegas, a panic. My mom called me one day and said, Brittany, we feel like something's going on. We hear that the cops are after you. Let's go to the beach house. The cops are after me? I said, for what? I hadn't done anything illegal. That I knew for sure. I'd had my moments. I'd, I'd had my wild spell. I, I had been high on Adderall and I'd acted crazy, but I didn't do anything criminal. In fact, as she knew, I'd been with my girlfriends the prior two days. My mom and I had had a sleepover with my cousin Allie and two other girlfriends. Just come to the house, she said. We want to talk to you. So I went to the house with them. The photographer met me there. My mother was acting suspicious. When the photographer got there, he said, something's up, right? Yeah, I said, something's really off. All of a sudden, there were helicopters going around the house. Is that for me? I asked my mom. Is this a joke? It wasn't a joke. Suddenly, there was a SWAT team of what looked like 20 cops in my house. What the F did I do? I kept screaming. I didn't do anything. I know I'd been acting wild, but there was nothing I'd done that justified their treating me like I was a bank robber. Nothing that justified upending my entire life. So this is literally the second time the family has called in a SWAT team to get Brittany. I mean, she's all of like, what, 5'4"? You know, why can't anybody sit down and have a decent conversation with this person? Why must we get in, you know, 20 members of the SWAT team? I don't understand the way this family functions. Why is it all going to be so dramatic? Sit the girl down and have a conversation. You know, and maybe if you'd put some more deposits in this bank, she wouldn't be kicking and screaming every time you guys come around. Maybe she would listen to you. Probably at this point, she's not willing to sit down and have a conversation because what have you ever done that showed her that that would be uh, fruitful for her to sit down and have a conversation? So maybe, maybe at this point, you actually do have to call in the SWAT team if you want anything done. Okay, so Brittany says that she feels like nothing that she did justified this kind of behavior from her parents. And, you know... It's hard, to, it's hard to know what you would do in that situation. If you were Lynn and Jamie Spears, who are terrible at communication and seem to have nary an ounce of compassion in your body, but you looked at what was going on with Brittany and you saw the degradation of her whole being, you know, out on display everywhere. She's going out partying. She's dating the enemy. She's not able to get custody of her kids. And if you are in the mood to believe everything that the, you know, all the rumors swirling around, you might think maybe she doesn't deserve to have the kids. You do see that she's high as a kite on Adderall 24 seven. It might lead you to believe she's not well. And if Brittany is actually acting crazy, as she said she was, then I can understand why they were like, we've got to get her under control. I think even parents who, I'm not even, like, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt in, in whatever way I can, in just saying, if you were her parents, would you have felt good about what was going on in her life? Would you have felt like this was a positive environment for her to be in? I later came to believe that something had changed that month since the last time I was brought to the hospital for evaluation. My father had struck up a very close relationship with Lou Taylor, who he worshipped. She was front and center during the implementation of the conservatorship that would later allow them to control and take over my career. Lou, who had just started a new company called TriStar Sports and Entertainment Group, was directly involved 
involved in calling the shots right before the conservatorship. At the time, she had few real clients. She basically used my name and hard work to build her company. Brittany says that conservatorships are called guardianships sometimes, and they're usually reserved for people who have no mental capacity and people who can't do anything for themselves. But I was highly functional. I'd just done the best album of my career, and I was making a lot of people a lot of money, especially my father, who I found out took a bigger salary than he paid me. He paid himself more than $6 million while paying others close to him tens of millions more. The thing is, you can have a conservatorship that lasts for two months, and then the person gets on track and you let them control their life again. But that wasn't what my father wanted. He wanted far more. She says that there's two kinds of conservatorships. There's the conservatorship of the person and the conservatorship of the estate. The conservatorship of the person is designated control details of the conservatee's life, like where they live, what they can eat, where they can drive in a car, what they do day to day. Even though I begged the court to appoint literally anyone else, and I mean anyone off the street would have been better, my father was given the job. The same man who'd made me cry if I had to get in the car with him when I was a little girl because he talked to himself. And the court was told that I was demented, and I wasn't even allowed to pick my own lawyer. That's an insane abuse of power. No one's going to give Brittany a pass for her behavior during those days. Even she doesn't give herself a pass for this behavior. But why in the world is Jamie Spears the one that's being given control over this? With just a little bit of digging, people could have found out he wasn't the one. He was not the one to be in charge here. The conservator of the estate, an estate worth, in my case, tens of millions of dollars at one point, manages the conservatee's affairs to keep them from being subject to undue influence or fraud. She said that her lawyer was named Andrew Wallet and he would eventually be paid $426,000 a year for keeping me from my own money. I would be forced to pay upward of $500,000 a year to my court-appointed lawyer who I wasn't allowed to replace. At least that's what she'd been told. She's later going to find out she could have, but she didn't know that at the time. She said that what she couldn't get over was the fact that she's just this five foot four pop singer, and she called everybody sir and ma'am. Why did they treat her like a criminal? There were times when I needed my father over the years, and I reached out, and he wasn't there. But when it was time for him to be the conservator, of course he was on the case. He's always been all about the money. And she says she can't say that her mom was much better. Of course, we wouldn't expect anything from Lynn. I mean, we've uh, this whole time we've expected nothing from Jamie. He's just been a deadbeat this whole time. Lynn, we had some hopes for, I think, a little bit. Like, she is the mom, come on. And that's why I'm so overly offended by everything she does. Because it's the mother, come on. Like, you know, the dad... I don't know. There's a lot of dads out there not doing their best. I'm not saying the dads don't love the kids. Of course they do. But I think that as mothers, so many times we're willing to just hang in there when it gets tough in a way that sometimes fathers aren't. So Lynn, what the hell? She says she, she'd she acted innocent while well, she was there for two sleepover nights with my girlfriends and me. She'd known the whole time that they were going to take me away. I am convinced that it was all planned and that my dad and my mom and Lou Taylor were all involved. TriStar was even planning to be my co-conservator. Later, I learned that at the time, they put me into the conservatorship on the heels of his bankruptcy. My dad had been financially indebted to Lou, owing her at least $40,000, which is a lot of money for him, especially back then. And that is what my new lawyer, Matthew Rosengart, later called a conflict of interest in court. Soon after I was brought to the hospital against my will, I was informed that the conservatorship papers had been filed. Okay, so I can hear my family. They're up. The last video I did, um, I continued recording even though I knew my family was up and the audio was pretty bad and I had a lot of comments about it so I'm going to end it now um, but I think it's actually a really good place to end right there the conservatorship is beginning and it is going to be horrific for Brittany from here on out all of her freedom is gone I mean every ounce of it is gone and it's just shocking to me how they can keep peddling her out there and being like perform Brittany perform go on this show do this tour all of this if she's so incapable of running her own life why are you trusting her to be in a show why are you trusting her to be on tour why are you trusting her to talk on a morning show why 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 and that's the same thing Brittany keeps asking you know it's so obvious that they were using her as a cash cow and for nothing else she was enslaved to her family and the fact that the court continued to let that happen, I mean, you guys, we got questions about what's going on in California all the time as far as like government, judicial system, and all of this. This is another great example of what the hell's going on in California. How in the world was this possible for them to treat her like this, for them to continue to turn a blind eye? I'm not saying that Brittany didn't need some help. She certainly needs some extensive therapy. 
I mean, full body talk therapy, trauma therapy. I mean, she needs all the therapies. But she also just needs love. And she needs people who actually care about her. And she needs the people who are supposed to care about her, her mom and dad, to finally stand up and take ownership of the child that they get, had together and actually care for her and love for her. And I think that that would do a multitude of good in her life if they would just stop acting so cold and cruel and hateful. But it's just going to go downhill from here. I mean, we're going to be reading about Brittany's mom's memoir that she wrote and the way she peddled that at the height of Brittany's pain. It's just astounding. It's truly astounding. Anyway, more on that uh, later this week. Uh, our next episode will be a Trader King episode, and we are continuing to follow Wallace and Edward VIII as they meander through a post-World War II world. They are looking like the fools that they are. And if you have not tuned in to that series, um, I would highly recommend it. It's not called the original Harry and Meghan for nothing because there's so many parallels. Differing things too, but the parallels, oh my gosh, shocking, 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 shocking how similar those two things were. And for Queen Elizabeth's life to have been bookended by these two sets of characters, what a tragedy. What a tragedy that she had to experience both of these crazy couples. Anyway, another chapter of that coming out. My next episode will be on that. And then, um, of course, I had had high hopes that I'd finish the Britney book before the new year. Probably won't, but that's okay. Now my new goal <laughs> is to start the uh, Matthew Perry book on the anniversary of the channel. So I think I started the channel on January 11th, I think. I don't know. I have to go back and look at my planners. Um and uh, I think it would be fun to start that new book on that date. So that's what we'll do. I also want to say, as sort of a like anniversary episode, um, you guys have had a lot of questions about me personally in the comments over the years. And I've been like, I'll answer that at some point. And I never actually have. So I was thinking about making a post on my community tab. Um, and it's just going to ask, hey, if you have any questions that you'd like answered, I'll do an episode for the anniversary on just anything you ever wanted to ask me, um, and I'll answer it as, as to the best of my ability, unless it's like super personal, like my social security number, and then I won't tell you that. <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.